Right. Good morning. Good morning. Hey, Marshall. Good to see you. Um, open your Bibles, if you would, to Genesis chapter 1. Genesis chapter 1. Okay, we're going to be flipping around a little bit. Genesis chapter 1. Genesis 1, uh, verse 26. God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness. And let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the fowl of the air and over the cattle and over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth. So God created man in his own image in the image of God created he him male and female created he them. And God blessed him and said and uh, God blessed him and God said unto them, Be fruitful, multiply, and replenish the earth, and subdue it, and have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the fowl of the air, and over every living thing that creepeth upon the, or excuse me, every living thing that moveth upon the earth. And then uh, he said unto them, Behold, I have given unto you every herb bearing seed which is upon the face of all the earth, and every tree in the, uh, in the which is the fruit of the tree yielding uh, seed, to you it shall be for meat or for food. And to every beast of the earth, and to every fowl of the air, and to everything that creepeth upon the earth, uh, upon the earth, wherein there is life. I have given every green herb for me, and it was so. And God said, and God saw everything that He had made, and behold, it was very good. And the evening and the morning were the sixth day. All right. So we're looking at the beginning here when God first created. Now we're going to go into chapter 2 and we're going to see a little bit more elaborated upon because chapter 1 here is giving like a synopsis of his overall with regard to creation though he gets a little bit more specific as to how he had made man. He formed him out of the dust of the ground. He would breathe them to him the breath of life in particular. That was Adam and then from Adam's rib after he had put him to the deep sleep he takes uh, well from Adam's side, he takes his ribbon and he creates Eve. Uh, and then wakes him up, they're together, and then we have the institution of marriage, but he still had had the same responsibility. Uh, we see going into chapter three that he is going to be walking in the midst of the, car in the garden in the cool of the day, and he was given a specific command by God that was that he used to tend to the garden uh, but he's not to eat of the tree of the fruit of the knowledge of good and evil. For in the day that thou eatest her up, thou shalt surely die. All right, so just so you know, we are introducing our uh, series here on biblical manhood, biblical womanhood. And so what we want to do is we want to take time to research what the Bible has to say as far as what it is to be a man, what it is to be a woman, what the Bible actually teaches with regard to we're going to be answering some of the questions as far as okay transgenderism is it legitimate and all uh, and, and those kinds of things as well in the series but initially we want to set the foundation in what 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 was God's plan what was God's intent so we go to Genesis and that's what we're looking at is when you know when God created man how did he create him and uh, what was what was his purpose if there is anything like how it's stated with regard to that. And we're, that's actually pretty interesting. We're going to see two things, just so you know. Uh, he was created to worship, and he's created in particular to glorify God. Uh, we'll notice when we look at what God did with the other aspects of creation, as far as not just the stars and then creating the firmament, creating the, the trees, creating the animals. They all reflect him. They all reflect his character. And then in with man in particular, he's distinguished from the others and the other things that he had created in particular because he was created in God's own image. Uh, and that's not said of any, and that's not even said of the angels. Even though that the angels are created higher than us, if we read in Hebrews and other portions of scripture that the, the angels, uh, you know, they're, they're, they're higher as far as in that they're, they're more powerful. Uh, but they weren't, even they, they weren't created in God's image. Uh, but we were. We were, we were created in God's image. Uh, we were particularly created to worship, to glorify God, 
and then we are created to work. Okay, those are two things that are going to stand out, and that's what we're going to be focusing on as far as biblical manhood, biblical womanhood, uh, God's intent or God's design, one that we would worship. Okay, in, in encompassing that really is that we're glorifying God, and then that two is that we would work. Okay, God God created us to work, and I, I think we'll we'll see that here. Um. Uh, we'll start reading in chapter 2, verse 1. It said, Thus the heavens and the earth were finished, and all the host of them. And on the seventh day God ended his work which he hath made, and he rested on the seventh day from all his work which he hath made. And God blessed the seventh day and sanctified it, because that in it he hath rested from all his work which God created and made. These are the generations of the heavens and of the earth. Uh, when they were created in the day that the Lord made the earth and the heavens. And every plant of the field before it was in the earth, and every herb of the field before it grew. Uh, for the Lord God hath not caused it to rain upon the earth, and there was not uh, there was not a man to fill the ground, uh, or excuse me, to till the ground. Uh, but there went up a mist from the earth and watered the whole face of the, of the ground. The Lord God formed man out of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life and man became a living soul. And then the Lord God planted a garden eastward in Eden and he had put the man whom he had formed uh, and out of the ground made the Lord God to grow every tree that is pleasant to the sight and good for food. That's uh, the tree of life also in the midst of the garden and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And a river went out of Eden to water the garden and from thence it was parted and became into four heads. Uh, the name of the first is Pison, uh, that, is, that is it which compasses the whole land of Havila, where, where there is gold. And the land, or excuse me, the gold of that land is good, uh, where there is Dilium and the onyx stone. And the name of the second river is uh, Gihon, uh, the same is it that compasses the whole land of Ethiopia. And the name of the third river is uh, Hidakal, and that is it which goeth toward the east of Assyria, and the fourth river is Euphrates. And the Lord God took the man and put him into the garden of Eden to dress it and to keep it. Okay, so uh, there's a recurring theme here. Uh, initially, you see that dust of the or earth was watered with mist, and he had done so in particular, it says that because there was not a man yet to till the ground. Uh, in verse 4. Now after he creates man, um, he puts him within a garden, but now God is creating a garden. Um, and he, he creates a, all these these trees. Well, granted, this was all done beforehand, and he puts puts the man in the midst of it. But And then you see the, the description here of, of what, uh, the rivers that are given. But he, he, in verse 15, he tells us that he particularly put him in the garden to dress it and to keep it. Okay, to dress it and to keep it. In other words, he's a, he's a gardener. He's a landscaper. He's, now I know this seems kind of silly, but why would that have to be necessary? Yeah, go ahead. To give him something to do. Okay, true, yeah. Anything else? Work was not part of the curse. Only the labor of it was, so... I, I don't know if that answers your question. Okay, well, all right. <laughs> what happens when you have like fruit trees or land or gardening that is not tended to. It overgrows and gets weeds. It it looks pretty bad, right? Now I know it seems kind of silly. This is before sin has taken you know place. Okay, this is before before the fall. But he got planted a garden, 
and then he's got everything in place that would be necessary for everything to grow and produce fruit. I mean, naturally, if you got a fruit tree, when, whenever, depending on the, well, they, they, we wouldn't even have had seasons at this point in time, though there would be seasons. Um, you have a division between night and day that he talks about, and then you have times, but you wouldn't really have the seasons until following uh, whenever you have uh, change. It would have been a temperate half. I'm sorry. <laughs> here's, here's what I mean by that. You wouldn't have had change in climate. It, the climate would have been stabilized. You wouldn't have had extreme cold or extreme heat. You wouldn't have had, why not? As I'm thinking. Um, to answer that one, because the Earth was going around, it hadn't gone uh, diagonal yet, because it went diagonal. What thing with Earth? Noah? But, I mean, why would the flood have caused the tilt of the Earth? That's caused by the well, fact that we have a moon, and the fact that the moon is at a. <coughs> I can't speak for as far as the angle. Okay. Uh, the only thing I would is because of the breaking of you have the water in the firmament that would have had the canopy effect anymore. Then you would have had the misting of the ground as as per prior because they wouldn't have had rain. So we don't know that either. That's again, yeah, that's conjecture from that's conjecture. from from, from Hoven. Yeah. From Kevin Hoven. <laughs> um, but that's <laughs> <laughs> I would, he does speak of the seasons being in place, but you don't have, you wouldn't have had the, well, okay. My conjecture on it would be, be taken from what Brother Hoven had explained, would, you wouldn't have had the extremes in temperature. Okay, so there's a theory that says that we wouldn't have had, but that's not necessarily a physical. Yeah, you can't really gather. You can't say dogmatically. Right. Okay. okay. Thank you. <laughs> Um, here, here's, here's the, I guess the point with it is that, okay, you have a lot of growth, okay? There's a lot of production taking place. Now, these two things are going to be noticeable. God's productive, okay? Because we are created in his image, in his likeness, okay, that part of his character is something that is going to be preeminent in us. Now, mind you, we are removed from that because, to some degree, um, because of Adam's sin. So in other words, we have God's image, but marred by sin. Not to the extreme or to the degree that you are, as far as closer to being godly or, or not, if you were to look at it on a scale or something like that. As far as, okay, this is more godly than this would be over here, is dependent on obviously a number of factors, upbringing being primary, but uh, your responsiveness to God's teaching and such. But the fact is, we all have God's image on us because of being created in God's likeness. Okay? Now, granted, us marred by sin, nonetheless, we're created in God's image and God's desire, God's heart, God's. Uh, character was one of industry. He created. He created the worlds. He created the not just the sun, moon, stars, and then he would create the earth. He would create the herb bearing seed. He would create the tree yielding fruit. Um, and that is something that's growing, that's reproductive. Okay, so God's intent with it, not only did he have that with the non-living, if you want to call it like that, but they're really living, the trees and the, and the plants and such, but uh, you would have it with the animals, that they would, because he gave man not only just to be able to go ahead and to tend to the garden, uh, but we see synopsized in chapter one that he is to have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the fowl of the air, over the beasts of the field, and over every cricket thing that creepeth upon the earth. And so you would have critters that were created to reflect God's glory, 
to demonstrate who he is and that were to be tended to, that were to be managed. And there was a, there was a, there was a responsibility that was given there uh, by God to man. Uh, and he also said to man that they're supposed to be uh, fruitful, multiply, and replenish the earth. So as with the other aspects of creation that they are producing and reproducing, uh, man was created in that same, uh, in that same manner. And so in other words, God intended for man to be able to have multiple children. That's God's original intent. Now, mind you, this is before sin, but God's original intent or original design was that, that we would have production. So in other words, that there would be industry. We would be active in doing stuff and producing stuff, reproducing. Um, he gave them, yes, a task in the garden. Now, on a practical level, he, okay, he, leave a garden alone, it's going to be overrun, it's going to be a mess. So if you give him, yes, something to do, but I believe it's also because it's, it's, it was God's character and uh, God's heart. He, he does things. That's who he is. Um, so that's a reflection of God's character in our design. Okay, and the Psalms, uh, Psalm 19 in particular, that the heavens declare the glory of God, the firmament showeth his handiwork, that uh, night unto night and day unto day, that their speech, their line gone out before all the earth. Uh, there's not, basically, there's nowhere where their speech is not heard. Uh, it's the same with man. In other words, there's not a place where you can uh, go, you know, not find man and then see God's image or have an understanding of the fact that uh, even on a primal level, if you've not been exposed to it, God's teaching. The fact is, you see what God has created. You automatically are bound to think because of how we're created with eternity in our heart. Even in Romans, that we're told that uh, even the invisible things from the beginning of the world, His eternal power and Godhead, are clearly understood and clearly known, uh, so that they are without excuse. We know that God's imprint on us as humans uh, is very distinct and clear. So much so that we seek. Uh, something to worship. So God created us in His image and His likeness, and then we, uh, because of His image, His likeness, His character of being industrious, we in turn are to be industrious. If we're going to be somebody that glorifies God, uh, if we're going to be godly, if we're going to be uh, men as how God created us, or even women. As God created us, we are to seek to be industrious. Okay, now our nature uh, quite often is to be selfish and to not want to work or to shirk aspects of work. Um, but the fact is, God's created us for for industry. Um, go to well, okay. We'll go to verse uh, chapter three. Chapter three. Now the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field which the Lord God hath made. And he said unto the woman, Yea, hath God said, Ye shall not eat of every tree of the garden? And the woman said unto the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden, uh, but of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God hath said, Ye shall not eat of it, neither shall ye touch it, lest ye die. Okay. And the serpent said unto the woman, Ye shall not surely die. Uh, for God doth know that in the day ye eat thereof, then your eyes shall be opened, and ye shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. And when the woman saw that the tree was good for fruit, that it was pleasant to the eyes, and a tree to be desired to make one wise, she took of the fruit thereof, and did eat, and gave also unto her husband with her. And he did eat. And the eyes of both of them were opened, and they knew that they were naked, and they sewed fig leaves together, and uh, made aprons of made themselves aprons. The Lord, and they heard the voice of the Lord uh, God walking in the garden in the cool of the day, and Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God amongst the trees of the garden. The Lord God called unto Adam and said unto him, Where art thou? And he said, I heard the voice in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked and hid myself. And he said unto him, uh, Who told thee that thou was naked? Hast thou eaten of the tree whereof I commanded thee that thou shouldest not eat? And the man said, The woman and thou gavest to be with me, she gave me of the tree, and I did eat. 
came, the Lord God said unto the woman, What is it that thou hast done? And the woman said, The serpent beguiled me, and I did eat. And the Lord God said unto the serpent, Because thou hast done this, thou art cursed above all cattle and above every beast of the field. Upon thy belly shalt thou go, and dust shalt thou eat all the days of thy life. And I will put enmity between thee and the woman, between thy seed and her seed, and it shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his heel. Okay, and to the woman he said, I will greatly multiply thy sorrow on thy conception. In sorrow shalt thou bring forth children, and thy desire shall be uh, to thy husband, and he shall rule over thee. And unto Adam he said, Because thou hast hearkened unto the voice of thy wife, and hast eaten of the tree of which I commanded thee, saying, Thou shalt not eat of it, cursed is the ground for thy sake, and sorrow shalt thou eat of it all the days of thy life. Thorns also and thistles shall it bring forth to thee, and thou shalt eat the herb of the field. In the sweat of thy face shalt thou eat bread, till thou return to the ground. For out of it was thou taken, for dust thou art, and until dust thou shalt return. Then he's going to uh, make for them clothing of skin. But in particular with the curse, as uh, Lee had pointed out, it says, it's going to be sorrowful, Thorns and thistles also shall it bring forth to thee, and thou shalt eat of the herb of the field. It says, In the sweat of thy face thou shalt eat bread uh, till thou return unto the ground. Uh, okay, so you have these aspects of the curse now that are affecting our ability to be industrious. Um, what that is is that work was not sorrowful, was not painful, was not diminishing of energy prior to the sinfall. Okay? So once we're cursed, um, we now have that which produces sorrow to us in our labor, in our work. Okay, so we have sweat of the brow. Um, it's going to be diminishing of our energies. It is thorns and thistles are going to be brought out in it. And so we're going to have that which is going to be painful and is going to be basically, you could say, kind of an obstacle to our being able to have good uh, crop. And so not only would that be the case and take place, and mind you, that's not been diminished. Um, we're going to look at that. I'm not going to have time for it today. We're going to look at that through our series here, but the fact is God's never diminished that as far as, in other words, uh, because we are born again now, if we've trusted Jesus as our Savior, the fact is, uh, it's not as if, okay, we don't have thorns and thistles, it's not as if we don't have sorrow, it's not as if we don't have sweat of thy brow that we're going to eat our bread, uh, but rather, we have God's grace to be able to strengthen us, to enable us to be able to meet tasks, and meet the obstacles, and meet the difficulties, uh, to that they're there to face us whenever we labor, whenever we work. Uh, but God's intent was that we labor. Now, mind you, that this aspect of labor now is included because of the curse, uh, but God's intent was not changed yet. Uh, it's going to make childbearing sorrowful. Uh, as for the woman, they're going to have pain in it. And then he added a few things that would have been different here. Um, it says, she, her desire is going to be to the, her husband, and he shall rule over thee. Um, you wouldn't have had the relationship that we have now where you have had, uh, where the woman is going to want to usurp the man. Um, and then we're, we're, we're taught on that in um, First Timothy and then also Titus uh, as well, that with regard to a husband and wife relationship, uh, where... And, well, in Ephesians as well, as far as the, uh, the husbands are supposed to love the wives, but the, the wives are supposed to reverence their husbands. Now, prior to the fall, that wouldn't have been an issue, but now since the fall, um, her desire is going to want to basically, to your suffer, to want to overthrow him. She's going to want to be the one in charge, but he's the one that is to rule. Um, now, biblical outlook is to be one that says, I'm the boss, not necessarily because I'm better, I'm more qualified, or even that, you know, 
as the case may be that the demand may be stronger, but rather it's because God wants that this way. Uh, we're told that in First Timothy with regard that the woman was deceived and the transgression, uh, but Adam was not. And so what God does is now he has set up uh, an authority structure into which you have the man uh, being in charge and then you have the woman to follow up under. Now mind you, it's not that he's better, uh, it's just God's authority structure. She's created with a different purpose. Um, and it's not that uh, you have this competition of one being better than the other. Um, you know, you know, she's a lesser being or anything like that, but rather that uh, God's design or God's heart for it because of following the fall, because of the transgression, because of being deceived by the serpent is that um, Adam be the one uh, to take charge and take hold and to, to, to have weight, basically the weight of the responsibility in the leadership with, um, in, a, in, a man, in a marriage relationship. But the little manhood, the little womanhood, you look to God and you look to God's design and then you seek to follow God's design. Now we've looked to see that man was created in particular uh, with a job, with a task that he was given, and that task was given to him by God, uh, and he is to seek to fulfill it. Now, since the fall, there's going to be pain, there's going to be sorrow, there's going to be aspects of it that are going to be uh, painful, that are going to be obstacles to his being productive, but nevertheless, that's not changed. He used to seek to, to be productive because God, that's how God is, and that's how God has created us to be. Uh, Go to chapter 4, and then I want to trace this line of thinking out in a few other scriptures uh, with what I'm about to say. Okay, it's in Adam knew uh, <coughs> Eve, his wife, and she conceived and bare Cain and said, I have gotten man from the Lord. And she bare Cain his brother Abel, and Abel was a keeper of the sheep, uh, but Cain was a tiller of the ground. And in the process of time, it came to pass that Cain brought of the fruit of the ground an offering unto the Lord. Okay, interesting. And then Abel, he also brought of the firstlings of his flock of the fat thereof, and the Lord had respect unto Abel uh, and to his offering, but unto Cain and to his offering he had not respect. And Cain was very wroth, and his countenance fell. Okay, question. Um, I know I've asked this question before. How many people are on planet Earth at this time? Say it again. How many people are on planet Earth at this time? Seems like four. Okay. There's a possibility it could be more. Um, but we have at least four that are mentioned specifically. Right? Where are they going to find or get some kind of idea of bringing offerings to God, bringing offerings to the Lord? Hi. Morning. Uh, we're in Genesis chapter 4. Genesis chapter 4. Um, where are they going to get that idea from? Why would they even be bringing an offering to God? Um, would it be because God had to shed um, the lambs or whatever to clothe Adam and Eve? He might have explained the reason why. Shedding the blood. Okay. Um, basically, yeah, in other words, God told him, hey, this is what you do to have a right relationship with me, or to maintain a right relationship with me. You bring offerings. Okay. Now, I know it seems <coughs> silly, but like, why is that necessary? <laughs>
Go to verse 4. Okay. And the serpent said unto the woman, Ye shall not surely die. All right. we, we know that was a lie. It says, For God doth know that in the day ye eat thereof, uh, then your eyes shall be opened, and ye shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. Right? Um, the idea of ye shall be as gods, knowing good and evil, is basically like, you'll be like God, and you'll be able to good, evil. In other words, you're going to be like God. Now, what was some of Satan's declarations when he was cast out? Or right prior to being cast out? I would like more sign. That's one of them, yeah. <laughs> I will exalt my throne. I will be like as the most high. In other words, he, Satan wanted to be like God, and he was cast out. Sin was found in him, and then he was cast out from heaven. Okay, well, at the, he was Lucifer at the time. Um, if, <coughs> excuse me, go to Romans chapter 1. Romans chapter 1. Uh, starting at verse 18. It says, For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who hold the truth in unrighteousness. Or they suppress the truth. They hold it back. Because that which may be known of God is manifest in them, for God has showed it unto them. Okay, that's our conscience. It's because of, that's how we're created. For the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. Okay? Because that, when they knew God, they glorified Him not as God, neither were thankful, but became vain in their imaginations, and their foolish heart was darkened. Professing themselves to be wise, they became fools and changed the glory of the uncorruptible God into an image made like to corruptible man and to birds and to four-footed beasts and creeping things. Okay? And wherefore God also gave them up to uncleanness through the lust of their own hearts to dishonor their own bodies between themselves, who changed the truth of God into a lie and worshiped and served the creature more than the creator who is blessed forever. Amen. Notice, well, you, we can go further and we can see just to what degree and to what extent that all looks like. But he said specifically, okay, they changed the truth of God into a lie and worshiped and served. Now, why would they be doing that? Mind you, these are people that are refusing to acknowledge God. They don't even like to retain God in their knowledge. They don't. They want to reject any kind of semblance of who God is in their mind. But yet, they serve and they worship something. In particular, they serve and worship creatures. Okay. Now, what they did, because they didn't want to retain God's knowledge in their mind, they turned from truth to... I mean, what else? What other alternative do you have to turn to once you leave truth? Nothing but lies. Okay, so what they do is they make images of corruptible man and of four-footed beasts and things and critters. Right. So you can go anywhere on the planet, and you can see, uh, depending on how depraved the corrupt the culture is or whatever, they're going to be worshiping something, either men. Well, here in the U.S., it's money. You know, Hollywood, other other people these idols, <laughs> you know? <laughs> but then, I mean, you, we, I mean, we think of it like, okay, you go to South America or someplace like that, okay, they got these statues of, like, Mary, or they got statues of Saint such and such or whatever, right? Or you go to, um, you know, somewhere in the heart of deepest darkest, like, Central, uh, Central Africa, like, south of the Sahara. Uh, desert, and then you have people that are worshiping animals, uh, like critters. Like they, they make statues of of a, of a critter, of a goat, or something like that. Okay, or you would have Papua New Guinea. Okay, where they still believe they make um, whatever kind of similar to in parts of Haiti where you would have like food, and they would have like a doll that they would make up or whatever, and then they would have like casting of spells and witch doctors and that kind of thing. 
Uh, you can go anywhere in the world and then they have a fear of higher powers and greater powers and then they bring offerings and they worship these things. Now, I mean, if you don't want to retain God or your knowledge, why in the world would you even have that as a culture? I mean, we think we're civilized here in the U.S., but you do the same thing only with other humans, other men that are like really depraved, you know? So why, you know, we're created to worship. We're created to have that time where we're in communion and adoration with the Lord God himself. And so the thing is, that's, that's, how, that's how we're made. That's what we're made for. Uh, that hole, that emptiness you have in your life and your heart, because you need God. Okay? God's the only one that's going to be able to satisfy you in that. Uh, the Lord Jesus' relationship with him is the only thing that is ever going to be able to bring that contentment and that peace uh, that you lack or that you seek, that you're trying to fill it with whatever else that you think is out there that might be satisfactory, but it's all just lies. Uh, what did Eve do? She believed Satan's lies, and what did it do? It just brought her death. She saw that the tree was pleasant to the eyes, and it seemed like it was good for food, and his explanation, oh, that seemed pretty reasonable. It's the same appeals that we have to us today. It's the lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, and the pride of life uh, that you know that get us. And you can either choose to believe God, take Him in His word, or not. But the thing is, okay, so biblical manhood, biblical womanhood, we're created for industry. We're created to work. And if we're going to be godly, if we're going to glorify God, if we're going to fulfill our purpose, we're, we're going to be industrious. Now. As to what in particular that you would seek to do, uh, God will guide you in that if you're seeking Him. Uh, in Proverbs it tells us that uh, in all work there is profit. In all work there is profit, but the talking of the lips tendeth only to penury. Right? So in other words, there's, you find you something to do, and there's going to be profit in it. As to specifically, um, you know, okay, how, how am I supposed to pay my bills? What skill set am I supposed to go out and seek to develop? God will guide you in that. We can, we can address that <laughs> later. Uh, we won't have time for that, for that. But God's made us to be industrious because that reflects Him, and we're created to worship because we are not only just in His image, but that's that's our need. We need it. Okay. God doesn't need our offerings, but we need God. It's how we commune with Him. Okay, the offering, yes, also looked forward and it was a testimony or testified of the fact that because at that time uh, they were looking forward to God's promise of redemption. Right? We are looking back now. So when we gather here at church, when we uh, you know, get, in our, get, get, in, get in our Bible in the Word of God, uh, we're supposed to be looking uh, for, I mean, yes, we gather to encourage one another. We're here to hear from God. Uh, but it's a, it's a, it's we're looking forward to Christ's return. Okay, we're supposed to be eagerly expecting Christ's return, and it's a testimony to those uh, that don't believe and unbelievers the fact that hey, Christ is risen from the dead and He's coming back. Okay, as um, as those uh, angels told the disciples uh, that this same Jesus which He had seen gone up and shall shall so come in like manner. So Christ is coming; He's going to return, and we're supposed to be eagerly awaiting that. But we need to worship God if we're going to be, obviously, <laughs> godly. And that's what we've been created for. Uh, nothing else is going to ever bring satisfaction to our hearts. Nothing else is ever going to fulfill the need that we have. Uh, nothing, nothing, nothing will ever do that. All right. Uh, is there any questions? Wow. Okay. All right. So we're going to continue looking at... Um, something I would recommend, some of my lesson, future lessons are going to be based on this. It's only a $5 book. Um, we might be able to get some for everybody available over here, or if not, you can just order it online if you wanted to. I think it's like seven fifty plus the shipping and handling, but it's like 5 bucks, pretty cheap. Um, and this is uh, Be What You Are. It's written by Nathan McConnell. And um, I would highly recommend it. It's not a very long book. It's only 50, 
62 pages long, um, extremely easy to read, uh, but it's he does a pretty good job as far as laying out a lot of, he's dealing primarily as far as like gender roles and distinction. Uh, so that some of that, when I get into that, we'll, I'll, be using some, I'll be using some of what you've written here. Uh, but the fact is, uh, it's it's good. It's a good it's a good resource for somebody that if you know that maybe you struggling with that, or maybe you come across as far as that might be. Well, what, what does the Bible have to say about it? I mean, he does a, he's a, he does a really good job of laying it out. All right. So no questions. Yes. Well, I just want to make a comment about chapter four. Yes. I don't know. What comes to mind for me about um, why you're willing to let's say tithe, uh -huh. give back to God, is because you're living still under the grace of God and um, still enjoying the presence of God and being grateful. You're wanting to give back to God because it brings them joy. That could be, yeah. Um, I don't know that that's necessarily Cain's motive, but the only reason I say that is because um, Cain, when he brought his offering, God didn't respect it, but he had knowledge of what was because of what God, the way God responded to him. God, God had told him that uh, he knew uh, ahead of time, or as far as he, he would have known, he would have known what would have been acceptable. But that is a good point that you do bring out, though. Thank you. All right, we're dismissed.